part one chapter ten of en route by jory karl heismans translated by charles keegan paul this librivox recording is in the public domain i shall make myself a prisoner in two days sighed durtal it is time to think about packing what books shall i take to help me live down there he searched his library and turned over the mystical books which had by degrees replaced profane works on the shelves i will not talk of saint teresa he thought neither she nor st john of the cross would be indulgent enough to me in solitude i have need of more pardon and consolation saint denis the areopagite or the apocryphal book known under that name he is the first of the mystics and perhaps has gone the furthest in his theological definitions he lives in the rarefied air of the mountain tops above the gulfs on the threshold of the other world which he sees in part by flashes of grace and he remains lucid undazzled in the blaze of light around him it seems that in his celestial hierarchies in which he brings out in procession the armies of heaven and shows the meaning of angelic attributes and symbols he has already passed the limits assigned to man and yet in his divine names he ventures even a step further and then he raises himself into the super essence of metaphysics at once calm and stern he overheats the human word to give it greater force but when after all his efforts he endeavours to define the indescribable to distinguish those never to be confounded persons of the trinity who in their plurality never lose their unity words fail on his lips and his tongue is paralysed under his pen then tranquilly and without any astonishment he makes himself again a child comes down from those heights among us and in order to try and explain to us what he understands he has recourse to comparisons with domestic life and that he may explain the trinity in unity he notices how if many torches be lighted in one hall lights though distinct mingle in one and are in fact no more than one saint denis thought durtal is one of the boldest explorers of the eternal regions but he would be dry reading at la trappe reisbroek he thought perhaps and yet i hardly am sure i might put him in my bag as well as for a cordial the little collection distilled by hello as for the spiritual marriages so well translated by metalink they are disconnected and obscure they stifle me this reisbroek oppresses me less this hermit is singular all the same for he does not enter into us but rather goes round about us he endeavours like saint denis to arrive at god rather in heaven than in the soul but in wishing to take such a flight he strains his wings and stammers incomprehensibly when he comes down we will leave him behind then now let us see st catherine of genoa her discussions between the soul the body and self-love are unmeaning and confused and when in her dialogues she treats of the operations of the interior life she is greatly below st teresa and st angela on the other hand her treatise on purgatory is clear it declares that she alone has penetrated into the spaces of unknown sorrows and that she has disentangled and taken hold of the joys she has in fact succeeded in reconciling two contraries which seemed eternally repugnant the suffering of the soul in its purification from sin and the joy of the same soul which at the very moment it is enduring frightful torment experiences immense happiness for little by little it draws near to god and feels his rays attract it more and more and his love inundated with such excess that it would seem the saviour desires naught but only it st catherine sets forth also that jesus forbids heaven to none that it is the soul herself who deeming herself unworthy to attain it flings herself by her own motion into purgatory there to cleanse herself for she has only one end to re-establish herself in her primitive purity only one desire to attain her last end by destroying herself annihilating herself losing herself in god this is a conclusive study murmured durtal but not that which would lead to la trappe we must try again he touched other volumes in the bookcases here for instance is one which obviously i should use he went on and took down the seraphic theology of saint bonaventure for he condenses the means of self-examination of meditation for communion of thoughts on death then in these selections is a treatise on the contempt of the world whose terse phrases are admirable it is the true essence of the holy spirit a jelly of unction firm set we will put that on one side i shall hardly find a better help to remedy the probable weariness of solitude murmured durtal turning over new ranks of volumes he looked at the titles 
the life of the blessed virgin by m ollier he hesitated saying to himself under a style which is like water with scarcely the chill off there are some interesting observations some tasteful comments m ollier has in a way traversed the mysterious territory of hidden designs and has there discovered the unimaginable truths which the lord is sometimes pleased to reveal to his saints he has made himself the liege man of our lady and living near her has made himself also the herald of her attributes the legate of her graces his life of mary is certainly the only one which seems really inspired and is possible to read where the abbess of agreda wanders he alone remains vigorous and clear he shows us the virgin existing from all eternity in god conceiving without ceasing to be immaculate like the crystal which receives and reflects the rays of the sun yet loses nothing of its lustre and indeed shines with greater brightness bringing forth without pain but suffering at the death of her son the pangs she would have borne at his birth then he gives us learned dissertations on her whom he calls the treasure-house of all good the mediatrix of love and impetration yes but to converse with her nothing is so good as the officium parvum beatae virginis and that concluded durtal i will put in my bag with my prayer-book we will not disturb m ollier's volume my stock begins to give out he continued angela of foligno certainly she is a brazier at which one may warm one's soul i will take her with me what more taula's sermons i am tempted to do so for never has any treated better than this monk the most abstruse subjects with a more perfectly lucid mind by aid of familiar images humble analogies he has rendered accessible the highest speculations of mysticism he is homely and deep then he borrows a little from quietism and perhaps it will be no bad thing to absorb down there a few drops of that mixture yet on the whole no i have rather need of nerve tonics as to suso he is a remedy far inferior to saint bonaventure or saint angela i put aside also saint bridget of sweden for in her conversations with heaven she seems aided by a god morose and tired who reveals to her nothing unexpected nothing new there is also saint magdalen of pazzi that voluble carmelite whose work is a series of apostrophes an exclamatory person clever at analogies expert in coincidences a saint infatuated with metaphors and hyperboles she talks directly with god the father and stammers out in ecstasy explanations of the mysteries revealed to her by the ancient of days her books contain one sovereign page on the circumcision another magnificent one entirely made up of antitheses on the holy spirit others very strange on the deification of the human soul on its union with heaven and on the part assigned in this operation to the wounds of the word these are inhabited nests the eagle which is the symbol of faith resides in the eyrie of the left foot in the hole of the right foot resides the melancholy sweetness of the turtle doves in the wound of the left hand the dove ensconces herself the symbol of surrender and in the cavity of the right hand reposes the pelican the emblem of love these birds leave their nests and come to seek the soul that they may lead it to the nuptial chamber of the wound which bleeds in the side of christ was it not also that carmelite nun who ravished by the power of grace despised so greatly the certitude acquired by the way of the senses as to say to the lord if i saw thee with mine eyes i should have faith no more because faith ceases where evidence comes in all things considered he said magdalen of pazzi with her dialogues and contemplations opens eloquent horizons but the soul snared in the bird lime of its sins cannot follow her no this saint cannot reassure me in the cloister ah he went on shaking the dust from a volume in a grey cover ah it is true i have the precious blood of father faber and he began to dream as he turned over its pages where he stood he remembered the impression till now forgotten produced on him when he read it the work of this oratorian was at least strange the pages boiled over ran forth tumultuously carrying with them grandiose visions such as hugo conceived developing historical perspectives such as michelet loved to paint in this volume was seen advancing the solemn procession of the precious blood starting from the confines of humanity from the origin of the ages and it broke the bounds of the worlds overwhelmed the nations submerged history father faber was less a mystic properly so called than a visionary and a poet in spite of the abuse of rhetoric transferred from the pulpit to a book he tore up souls by roots carried them away on the rush of the stream 
but when one regained footing and sought to remember what had been heard and seen one could recall nothing on reflection one recognized that the theme of the work was very thin too slender to have been executed by so noisy an orchestra and there remained of that reading something distracting and feverish which made you uneasy and made you think that this kind of book had only a very distant relation to the heavenly fullness of the great mystics no not that thought durtal now what have we selected i keep the little collection of reisbrook the life of angela of foligno and saint bonaventure and the best of all for my state of soul he said striking his forehead he went back to his bookcase and seized a little book which lay alone in a corner he sat down and turned it over saying here is the tonic the stimulant in weakness the strychnine for failure of faith the goad which drives you in tears to the feet of christ the dolorous passion of sister emmerich she was no chemist of the spiritual being like saint teresa she had nothing to do with our interior life in her book she forgot herself and left us on one side for she saw only jesus crucified and wished only to show the stages of his agony and to leave marked on her pages as on the veil of veronica the imprint of the holy face though she was of our time for catherine emmerich died in eighteen twenty four this great work dates from the middle ages it is a picture which seems to belong to the early schools of franconia and swabia this woman was the sister of the zeitbloms and the grunewalds she had their clear visions their vivid colouring their wild scent but she seemed to bring back also by her care for exact detail by her precise indication of places the old flemish masters roger van der weyden and Boots. she united in herself two currents springing one from germany the other from flanders and this painting brushed in with blood and varnished with tears was transposed by her into a prose style which has no relation to any known literature of which we can only find by analogy the ancestry in the panels of the fifteenth century moreover she was quite illiterate had never read a book nor seen a painting she told quite plainly what she saw in her ecstasies the pictures of the passion unfolded themselves before her while she was bedridden crushed by suffering bleeding from the wounds of her stigmata she mourned and wept brought to nothingness by love and pity before the torments of christ according to her words which a scribe took down calvary rose and the whole rascaldom of the soldiers rushed at the saviour and spat on him frightful episodes took place where jesus chained to a pillar twisting like a worm under the lashes of the scourges then falling looking with his failing eyes at the fallen women who held him by the hand and turned away in disgust from his lacerated body from his face covered with threads of blood as with a red net then slowly patiently only stopping to sob and cry for mercy she described the soldiers tearing away the stuff which had stuck to the wounds the virgin weeping her face livid and her lips blue she related the agony of his bearing his cross how he fell on his knees grew weaker and more worn when death came it was a frightful spectacle told in its every particular forming a sublime and frightful whole the redeemer was extended on a cross laid on the ground one of the executioners placed a knee against his side while another spread his fingers abroad and a third hammered in a flat-headed nail as broad as a crown and so long that the point came out behind the wood and when the right hand was riveted the torturers saw that the left would not reach to the place they intended to pierce therefore they attached a rope to the arm pulled it with all their force dislocated the shoulder and the cries of the saviour were heard above the blows of the hammer his breast was seen heaving while his body was anguished and furrowed by terrible shuddering the same scene was repeated to fix his feet they also did not reach the place which the executioners had marked the body had to be tied and the arms bound so as not to tear the hands from the wood and then it was necessary to hang on the legs so as to lengthen them as far as the bracket on which they were to rest all at once the entire body yielded the ribs moved under the skin the shock was so fearful that the executioners believed that the bones would start and burst the flesh wherefore they made haste to rest the left foot on the right but their difficulties began again the feet turned over and it was necessary to bore them with an auger to fasten them this continued till jesus died when sister emmerich fainted from terror her stigmata bled afresh and her wounded head rained blood in this book the whole pack of jewish hounds was seen in full cry the imprecations and shouts of the crowd were heard the virgin was shown trembling with fever the magdalen beyond herself was terrible by her cries and towering above this lamentable group christ appeared 
pale and swollen his legs entangled in his robe when he mounted to golgotha clenching his broken nails on the cross as it slipped from his grasp this extraordinary visionary catherine emmerich also described the surroundings of these scenes the landscapes of judea which she had never visited but have since been recognized as exact without knowing it without willing it this illiterate woman became an unique and powerful artist wonderful visionary wonderful painter cried durtal and also wonderful saint he added running over the life of this nun placed as a preface to the book she was born in seventeen seventy four in the diocese of munster the child of poor peasants from her infancy she had conversations with the virgin and possessed the gift which also was given to saint sibylline of pavia ida of louvain and more recently to louise lateau of discerning when she looked at or touched them objects which had been blessed from those which had not she entered as a novice the augustinian convent at Dumen, made her profession when she was twenty-nine her health failed and incessant pain tortured her which she increased for like blessed lidwine she obtained from heaven permission to suffer for others and succour the sick by taking their maladies in eighteen eleven under the government of jerome bonaparte king of Westphalia, the convent was suppressed and the nuns dispersed infirm and penniless she was carried to a room in an inn where she had to bear every sort of curiosity and insult christ added to her martyrdom in giving her the stigmata for which she asked she could neither rise nor walk nor sit could take no food but the juice of a cherry but she was transported by long ecstasies in these she visited palestine following the saviour step by step dictated with groans this fond book then said with her death rattle let me die in shame with jesus on the cross and died overwhelmed with joy thanking heaven for the life of suffering she had endured ah yes i will take the dolorous passion cried durtal to himself take the gospels also said the abbe who came in meanwhile they are the heavenly files from which you will draw the oil you need to dress your wounds it will be equally useful and truly in accordance with the atmosphere of la trappe to be able to read in the abbey itself the works of saint bernard but they consist of unmanageable folios and the abridgments and extracts in volumes of a more convenient form are so ill chosen that i have never had the courage to buy them they have saint bernard at la trappe and will lend you the volumes if you ask them but where are you from the spiritual point of view how are you getting on i am melancholy badly prepared and resigned i cannot tell if weariness has come from my turning always on the same round like a circus horse but at this moment i am not suffering i am persuaded that this change of place is necessary and that it would be useless to hesitate all the same he said after a silence it is very odd that i am going to imprison myself in a monastery and in truth in spite of myself that astonishes me i will admit said the abbe laughing that when i first met you at tocans i never thought i was pointed out to direct you to a monastery Ah, you see i must evidently belong to that category of people whom i may call mere bridges involuntary brokers of souls who are imposed on you for a certain end which you do not suspect and of which even themselves are ignorant rather if any one were a mere bridge in this matter answered durtal it was tocan for it was he who brought us together and we kick him away as soon as he has finished his unconscious task it was evidently designed that we should know each other that is true said the abbe with a smile now i do not suppose i shall see you again before you start for i go to-morrow to macon where i shall stay five days time to see my nephews and to sign some law papers at any rate keep up your courage and do not forget to send me news of yourself write to me without much delay that i may find your letter when i return to paris and as durtal thanked him for his constant kindness he took his hand and held it in his own say nothing about that he said you have only to thank him whose fatherly impatience has broken the obstinate slumber of your faith you owe thanks to god only thank him in getting rid of your nature as soon as possible and leaving the house of your conscience empty for him the more you die to yourself the better will he live in you prayer is the most powerful ascetic means by which you can renounce yourself empty yourself and render yourself humble in this matter pray therefore without ceasing at la trappe implore our lady especially for like myrrh which consumes the proud flesh of wounds she heals the ulcers of the soul i on my side will pray for you as best i can you can thus in your weakness lean so as not to fall on that firm and protecting pillar of prayer of which saint teresa speaks once again a safe journey to you 
we shall meet soon again my son good-bye durtal remained much disturbed it is most tiresome he thought that this priest is leaving paris before me for indeed if i have need of spiritual help or counsel to whom shall i go it is clearly written that i must end as i have begun alone but but solitude under these conditions is alarming i am no spoilt child whatever the abbe may say next morning durtal awoke ill furious neuralgia bored his temples like a gimlet he tried to stop it with antipyrine but this medicine in large dose put his stomach out of order without abating the strokes of the machine which penetrated his skull he wandered about his rooms changing from one seat to another coiling himself up in an armchair getting up to lie down again jumping from his bed in fits of sickness upsetting his furniture from time to time he could assign no precise cause for this attack he had slept his fill and had not exceeded in any way the night before he thought with his head in his hands there are still two days counting to-day before i leave paris and very fit i am for it i shall not be in a state to travel by train and if i travel the food at la trappe will finish me he had a minute's comfort from the idea that through no fault of his own he might perhaps avoid his painful duty and remain at home but the reaction was immediate he understood that if he did not go he was lost the vacillation of his soul had become chronic the crisis of disgust of self the acute regret of an effort consented to with pain and suddenly missed the certainty that it would only be postponed for a time that he would have to pass again through alternations of revolt and terror and begin again to fight with himself for conviction admitting that i am not in a state to travel i have always the resource of making my confession to the abbe when he returns and of communicating in paris he thought but he shook his head saying to himself once more that he felt and knew that was not his duty but then he said to god since thou dost implant this idea in me so violently that i cannot even discuss it in spite of its entire common sense for after all it is not necessary to immure myself in a trappist monastery in order to reconcile myself to thee then let me go and he spoke to god quietly my soul is an evil place sordid and infamous till now it has loved only perverse ways it has exacted from my wretched body the tithe of illicit pleasures and unholy joys it is worth little it is worth nothing and yet down there near thee if thou wilt succour me i think that i shall subdue it but if my body be sick i cannot force it to obey me this is worse than all i am disarmed if thou do not come to my aid take count of this o lord i know by experience that when i am ill-fed i have neuralgia humanly logically speaking i am certain to be horribly ill at notre dame de l'atre nevertheless if i can get about at all the day after to-morrow i will go all the same in default of love this is the sole proof i can give that i truly desire thee that truly i hope and believe in thee but then o lord aid me he added sadly ah indeed i am no lidwin or catherine emmerich who when thou didst strike them cried out more more thou dost scarce touch me and i protest but what wouldst thou thou dost know better than i physical suffering breaks me down drives me to despair he went to sleep at last to kill the day in bed slumbering to wake again suddenly from frightful nightmares the next day his head seemed empty and his heart feeble but his neuralgia was less violent he rose saying to himself that he must eat though he was not hungry for fear his pain should return he went out and wandered in the luxembourg saying to himself that he must arrange his time that after breakfast he would visit saint severin then he would go home and pack and afterwards finish the day at notre dame des victoires the walk did him good his head was lighter and his heart free he went into a restaurant where because of the early hour nothing was ready he spent the time before a newspaper on a bench how often he had held papers thus without reading them how many evenings he had waited in cafes with his nose in an article thinking of other matters at those times especially when he was striving with his vices when florence appeared to him still keeping the clear smile of a little girl on her way to school her eyes cast down her hands in the pockets of her apron suddenly the child changed into a ghoul who whirled round him wildly and made him silently understand the horror of his desires all that was now far distant almost in one day the charm was broken without any real strife or true effort 
without inward struggles he had abstained from seeing her and now when she roused his memory again she was no more in fact than a recollection odious and sweet after all thought durtal as he cut up his beefsteak i wonder what she thinks of me she must certainly suppose me dead or lost happily i have never met her and she does not know my address well he went on there is no use in stirring the mud it will be time to cleanse it when i am at la trappe and he shuddered for the idea of the confessor again took root in him and he was obliged to tell himself for the twentieth time that the expected never happens and to declare that he should find some good fellow of a monk who would listen to him then he was afraid again putting things at their worst and fancying himself turned out like a mangy dog he finished his breakfast and went to saint severin there the crisis declared itself the overcharged soul gave way struck down by a congestion of sadness he lay on a chair in such a state of depression that he could think no more he remained inert without the power of suffering till little by little the soul recovered from its torpor came to itself in a flood of tears these tears gave him solace he wept over his lot thought himself so unhappy so worthy of pity that he hoped still more for help yet he dare not address himself to christ whom he thought less accessible but he spoke in low tones to the virgin murmuring that prayer in which saint bernard reminds the mother of christ that never in human memory was it heard that she abandoned any of those who sought her aid he left saint severin consoled and more resolved and when once at home was taken up with preparations for departure afraid that he would find nothing he wanted down there he determined to stuff his portmanteau full he crammed into the corners sugar packets of chocolate that he might try to deceive if needful the anguish of a fasting stomach took towels thinking there would be few at la trappe prepared a stock of tobacco and matches and besides books paper pencils ink packets of antipyrine a phial of laudanum which he wrapped in handkerchiefs and wedged into his slippers when he had strapped his portmanteau he said to himself looking at the clock tomorrow at this time i shall be jolting in a cab and my seclusion will be near at hand never mind i shall do well in anticipation of bodily ailment to ask for the confessor as soon as i get there and suppose that turns out badly i shall have time to make arrangements and take the train back at once all the same this will not prevent my having a wretched moment this evening when i enter notre dame des victoires but his anxieties and emotions vanished when the hour of benediction came he was seized by the giddy infection of the church and he rapped steeped and lost himself in the prayer which arose from all those souls in the chant which went up from every mouth and when the monstrance was brought forward to make its sign in the air he felt a vast peace descend upon him at evening as he undressed he sighed to-morrow i shall lie down in a cell amazing when i think of it i should have considered any one mad who a few years ago had prophesied that i should take refuge in a trappist monastery yet now i am going there of my own accord and yet no i am going driven by an unknown power i am going as a whipped cur after all what a symptom of the time it is society must indeed be unclean if god has no longer the right to be hard and is reduced to pick up what he finds and to content himself with gathering to himself people like me End of part one chapter ten part two chapter one of en route by jory karl heismans translated by charles keegan paul this librivox recording is in the public domain durtal awoke gay and brisk astonished at not hearing himself groan when the moment had come in which he should set off for la trappe he was wonderfully reassured he tried to recollect himself and to pray but he felt his thoughts more scattered and wandering than usual he remained indifferent and unmoved surprised at this result he tried to examine himself and touched the void he was slack that morning in one of those sudden dispositions in which a man becomes a child again incapable of attention in which the wrong side of things disappears and everything distracts he dressed hastily got into a cab was too early at the station and there experienced a perfectly childish attack of vanity looking at the people who hurried through the waiting rooms thronged the ticket officers or resignedly followed their luggage he was not far from admiring himself if these travellers who think only of their pleasures or their business knew where i am going he thought 
then he reproached himself for the stupidity of these reflections and as soon as he was settled in his compartment in which he chanced to be alone he lighted a cigarette saying to himself let us profit at least by the time there is still for smoking and he began to wander to dream about the position of the monastery and rove about the neighbourhood of la trappe he remembered that a review had recently estimated the number of nuns and monks in france at two hundred thousand two hundred thousand persons who in such an epoch have understood the wickedness of the struggle for life the filth of sexual relations the horror of lyings in those are they who save the honour of the country he thought then passing at a bound from cloistered souls to the treatises he had put in his portmanteau he went on it is all the same curious how completely the temperament of french art rebels against mysticism all exalted writers are foreigners saint denis the areopagite was a greek eckhart tauler suso sister emmerich were germans weisbrook came from flanders saint teresa saint john of the cross saint marie d'agreda were spaniards father faber was english saint bonaventure angela of foligno magdalene of pazzi catherine of genoa jacopo de voragine were italians ah he said struck by the last name he had cited i ought to have brought his golden legend in my bag how was it i did not remember it for that book is in fact the very crowning work of the middle ages the stimulant for hours rendered languid by the prolonged uneasiness of fasting the simple aid of pious vigils for the most incredulous souls of our time the golden legend at least still seems like one of those pure parchments on which simple illuminators painted the faces of saints with gum water or white of egg on golden backgrounds jacopo de voragine is the jean fouquet the andre bonnevue of literary miniature of mystic prose it is quite absurd to have forgotten that book for it would have made me pass precious days like those of old in la trappe yes it is strange he thought returning on his thoughts and coming back to his first idea france can count religious authors more or less celebrated but very few mystical writers properly so called and it is just the same also in painting the true early masters are flemish german or italian none are french for our burgundian school descended from the flemish no it cannot be denied the genius of our race cannot easily follow and explain how god acts when he works in the central depths of the soul which is the ovary of thought the very source of conception it is refractory at explaining by the expressive power of words the crash or the silence of grace bursting forth in the domain which is wasted by sin it is inapt at extracting from that secret world works of psychology like those of saint teresa and saint john of the cross works of art like those of voragine or sister emmerich besides that our field is scarcely arable and our soil harsh where shall we now find the labourer who sows and harrows it who prepares not even a mystical harvest but even any spiritual fruit capable of assuaging the hunger of the few who stray and are lost and fall from inanition in the icy desert of our time he who should be the cultivator of that land the farmer of souls the priest has not strength to clear the ground the seminary has made him arbitrary and puerile life outside has made him lukewarm therefore it seems that god has withdrawn himself from him and the proof of this is that he has taken away all ability from the priesthood there are no priests now who have talent either in the pulpit or in books the laity have inherited that grace which was so common in the church of the middle ages another example proves it still more priests make so few conversions in these days the being who pleases heaven does without them the saviour himself strikes him down handles him works directly on him the ignorance of the clergy their want of education their unintelligence of their surroundings their dislike for mysticism their incomprehension of art have taken away all their influence on the aristocracy of souls their only action is now on the childish brains of bigots and pretenders and this is no doubt providential it is better so for if the priest became the master if he succeeded in raising and vivifying the wearisome tribe he manages it would be like a waterspout of clerical stupidity beating down on a country would be the end of all literature and all art in france to save the church there remains the monk whom the priest detests for the life of the cloister is a constant reproach to his own existence continued durtal always supposing that my illusions are not again destroyed when i see a monastery but no i am lucky 
i have discovered in paris one of those few abbés who is neither indifferent nor a pedant why should i not in an abbey come into contact with authentic monks he lighted a cigarette and looked at the landscape from the carriage window the train was passing through fields in front of which the telegraph wires danced in puffs of steam the landscape was flat and uninteresting durtal fell back sulkily in his corner the arrival at the convent disturbs me he murmured since there are no useless words to proffer i shall confine myself to giving his letter to the father guestmaster ah and then all will arrange itself he felt in fact a perfect calm and was astonished at not finding in himself any disgust or fear at being almost in high spirits well my good priest was right in declaring that i was creating monsters in advance and he thought of the abbe gevresin was surprised that long as he had visited him he knew nothing whatever of his antecedents that he was no more intimate with him than on the very first day in fact it only rested with me to question him discreetly but the idea never entered my head it is true that our intercourse has been strictly limited to matters of religion and art this perpetual reserve does not create very thrilling friendships but it institutes a sort of jansenism of the affections which is not without charm in any case that ecclesiastic is a holy man he has not even that manner at once caressing and reserved of other priests apart from certain gestures his habit of rolling his arms in his cincture of wrapping his hands in his sleeves of liking to walk backwards when in conversation apart from his innocent mania of interlarding his phrases with latin he does not recall either the attitude or the unfashionable speech of his brethren he loves mysticism and plain song he is exceptional and therefore he must have been also carefully chosen for me in heaven ah well we must be getting near he sighed looking at his watch i am beginning to feel hungry come that is all right we shall be at saint landry in a quarter of an hour he strummed on the windows of the carriage saw the fields and woods fly past smoked a cigarette or two took his bag from the rack at last arrived at the station and got out close to the tiny station he recognized the inn of which the abbe had told him he found a good woman in the kitchen who said all right sir sit down they will put the horse to while you breakfast he fed himself on uneatable things they brought him a calf's head forgotten in a tub some cutlets that were high vegetables blackened with gravy from the stove in his present mood he was amused at this infamous meal fell back upon a thin wine which rasped his throat and resignedly drank coffee which left a sediment of peat at the bottom of the cup then he climbed into a jolting car driven by a young man and the horse went off at a smart pace through the village and into the country on the way he asked the driver for some information about la trappe but the peasant knew nothing i often go there he said but never enter the carriage stays at the gate so you see i can tell you nothing they went for an hour rapidly through the lanes and the peasant saluted a roadmaker with his whip and said to durtal they say that the emmets eat their bellies and as durtal asked what he meant they are idle dogs they lie all the summer on their bellies in the shade and he said no more durtal thought of nothing he digested and smoked dizzy with the rumbling of the carriage at the end of another hour they came into the heart of the forest are we near oh not yet can we see la trappe from a distance oh no you must have your nose just over it to see it it is quite in a bottom at the end of a lane like that said the peasant pointing to a grassy lane into which they turned there is a fellow coming from the place he said pointing out a vagabond who was crossing the copse at a great pace and he explained to durtal that every beggar had a right to food and even to lodging at la trappe they gave them the ordinary fare of the community in a room close to the brother porter's lodge but did not let them into the convent when durtal asked him the opinion which the villagers round about had of the monks the peasant was evidently afraid of compromising himself for he answered some say nothing about them durtal began to be rather weary when suddenly as they turned out of a lane he saw an immense building below him there is la trappe said the peasant gathering his reins for the descent from the height where he was durtal looked over the roofs and saw a large garden with thickets and in front of them a formidable crucifix then the vision disappeared the carriage again went through the wood descending by zigzag roads where the foliage intercepted the view they came at last by long circuits to an open place at the end of which rose a wall with a large gate in the middle the carriage stopped 
you have only to ring said the peasant showing durtal an iron chain along the wall and he added shall i come for you again tomorrow no then you remain here and the peasant looked at him with astonishment turned about and drove up the hill durtal remained as one crushed his portmanteau at his feet before the door his heart beat violently all his assurance all his enthusiasm had vanished and he stammered what will happen to me within and with a swift feeling of dread there passed before him the terrible life of the trappists the body ill-nourished exhausted from want of sleep prostrate for hours on the pavement the soul trembling squeezed like a sponge in the hand drilled examined ransacked even to its smallest folds and at the end of its failure of an existence thrown like a wreck against this rude rock into the silence of a prison and the dreadful stillness of the tomb my god my god have pity upon me said he as he wiped his brow mechanically he looked around as if he expected some help the roads were deserted and the woods were empty no sound was heard in the country or in the monastery at any rate i must make up my mind to ring and his limbs sinking under him he pulled the chain the sound of the bell hard rusty grumbling sounded on the other side of the wall get up and don't be a fool he said to himself as he heard the clatter of a pair of sabots behind the door this opened and a very old monk clad in the brown cloth of the capuchins looked at him inquiringly i come to make a retreat and i wish to see father etienne the monk bowed took up the portmanteau and made a sign to durtal to follow him he went with bent head and short steps across an orchard they reached a grating passed on the right of the vast building a sort of dilapidated chateau flanked by two wings advancing on a court the brother entered the wing close to the grating durtal followed him along a corridor into which several grey doors opened on one of these he read the word auditorium the trappist stopped before it lifted the wooden latch ushered durtal into the room and after some minutes he heard repeated calls on the bell durtal sat down and looked at this gloomy chamber for the window was half closed by shutters there was little furniture the most important a dining table with an old cover in the corner a prie dieu above which was nailed a figure of saint anthony of padua rocking the infant jesus in his arms a large crucifix on the other wall and here and there were placed two high-backed chairs and four ordinary chairs durtal took from his pocket-book the letter of introduction to the father what sort of reception will he give me he asked himself he at any rate can speak well we shall soon see he said as he heard steps a monk in white with a black scapula whose two ends fell one on his shoulders the other on his breast appeared he was young and smiling he read the letter then he took durtal's hand and led him in silent astonishment across the court to the other wing of the building opened a door dipped his finger in a holy water stoop and offered it to him they were in a chapel the monk invited durtal by a sign to kneel on a step before the altar and he prayed in a low voice he then rose returned slowly to the threshold offered durtal holy water again still without opening his lips and leading him by the hand they went the way they came to the auditorium there he inquired after the health of the abbe gevrasin seized the portmanteau and mounted an immense staircase falling into ruin at the top of this staircase which had only one story there extended a vast landing bounded at each of its extremities by a door father etienne entered that on the right crossed a broad vestibule and led durtal into a room which a ticket printed in large letters placed under the invocation of saint benedict and said i am sorry sir to be only able to put at your disposal this room which is not very comfortable but it will do very well said durtal and the view is charming he continued approaching the window at least you will be in good air said the monk opening the casement below stretched the orchard through which durtal had passed under the conduct of the brother porter an enclosure full of apple trees stunted and clipped silvered by lichens and gilt by moss then beyond the monastery and above the walls rose fields of clover intersected by a great white road extending to the horizon which was notched by the foliage of trees you will see sir father etienne went on if you need anything in this cell and tell me quite simply will you not 
for otherwise we should heap up regret for both of us for you who have only to ask for what might be useful to you for me who should only discover it later and be sorry for my forgetfulness durtal looked at him reassured by this frank greeting he was a young priest about thirty years old his face bright and finely cut was streaked with red fibres on the cheeks this monk wore a beard and round his shaven head was a crown of brown hair he spoke somewhat rapidly and smiled with his hands pushed into the large leathern belt round his waist i will come back directly for i have some important work to finish he said try to make yourself at home as much as possible and if you have time glance over the rule which you have to follow in this monastery it is written on one of these cards on the table we will talk about it after you have mastered it if you like and he left durtal alone he soon made an inventory of the room it was very high and extremely narrow like a gun barrel the door was at one end the window at the other at the bottom in a corner near the casement was a little iron bed and a small round table in chestnut wood at the foot of the bed which stood along the wall was a prie dieu in faded rep upon which was a crucifix and a branch of dried fir below it on the same side was a table of white wood covered with a towel on which were placed an ewer a basin and a glass on the opposite wall was a wardrobe and by the fireplace on the mantelpiece of which a crucifix was placed was a table opposite the bed near the window three straw chairs completed the furniture of this room i shall never have water enough to wash in thought durtal gauging the miniature jug which held about a pint since father essien shows himself so obliging i must ask him for a larger ration he unpacked his portmanteau undressed put on flannel instead of his starched shirt arranged his toilet things on the washing stand folded his linen in the wardrobe then sat down looked around the cell and thought it sufficiently comfortable and above all very clean he then went towards the table on which were laid a ream of ruled paper an inkstand and some pens he was grateful for this attention of the monk who knew no doubt by the abbe gevrezin's letter that his business was writing opened two volumes bound in leather and shut them again the one was the introduction to the devout life by st francis de sales the other was manresa or the spiritual exercises of st ignatius of loyola and he arranged his own books on the table then he took up just as it came one of the cards spread on the table and read exercises of the community for ordinary days from easter to the invention of the cross in september rise two primae and mass five fifteen work after the chapter end of work and leisure time nine sext eleven angelus and dinner eleven thirty siesta after dinner end of siesta one thirty none and work five minutes after waking end of work and leisure four thirty vespers followed by prayer five fifteen supper and leisure six compline seven twenty five retire to rest eight he turned the card and on the other side was a new horary entitled winter exercises from the invention of the cross in september to easter the hour of rising was the same but bedtime was an hour earlier dinner was changed from eleven thirty to two siesta and supper at six o'clock were suppressed the canonical hours were the same except vespers and compline which were changed from five fifteen and seven twenty five to four thirty and six fifteen it is not pleasant to drag oneself from bed in the middle of the night sighed durtal but i am inclined to think that the retreatants are not subject to this rule of wakefulness and he took up another card this must be the one intended for me he said reading the head of the card rules of retreat from easter to the invention of the cross in september let us look at these rules rather more closely he examined the two tables brought together one for the morning and one for the evening morning four rise at the angelus bell four thirty prayer and meditation five fifteen prime and mass six to seven examination of conscience seven breakfast seven thirty way of the cross eight sext and none eight thirty second meditation nine spiritual reading eleven adoration and examination tierce eleven thirty angelus dinner recreation twelve fifteen siesta absolute silence evening one thirty end of siesta rosary two vespers and compline three third meditation 
three fifteen spiritual reading four fifteen matins and louds five fifteen reflections choir vespers five thirty examination and prayer six supper and recreation seven litanies absolute silence seven fifteen assisted compline seven thirty salve regina angelus seven forty five private examination retire to rest this at any rate is more practical four o'clock in the morning is an almost possible hour but i do not understand it the canonical hours on this tablet do not agree with those of the monks and then why these double vespers and compline lastly these little points in which you are invited to meditate so many minutes to read so many more scarcely suit me my mind is scarcely malleable enough to run in those channels it is true that after all i am free to do as i please for no one can verify what tricks i may play can know for instance if i meditate ah here is again a regulation at the back he went on as he turned the card the regulation for september i need not trouble myself about it it differs moreover little from the other but here is a postscript which concerns both horaries note one those who are not bound to say the breviary will say the little office of the blessed virgin two the retreatants are requested to make their confessions at an early date in order to have their mind more free for meditation three after each meditation an analogous chapter of the imitation must be read four the best time for confessions and the way of the cross is from six to nine in the morning two to five in the afternoon and in summer from nine in the morning till five in the afternoon five to read the table of notices six it is well to be punctual at meals to keep no one waiting seven the father guest master alone is charged with providing for the wants of guests eight guests may ask for books for the retreat if they have none themselves confession he saw this word only in the whole series of rules he must at once have recourse to it he felt a cold shiver down his back and knew that he must speak to father Essien about it as soon as he returned he had not long to wrestle with himself for the monk entered almost at once and said have you noticed anything you need and the presence of which may be useful to you no father yet if you could let me have a little more water nothing is easier i will send you up a large pitcher every morning thank you see i have been studying the rules i will at once put you at ease said the monk you are compelled to nothing but the strictest punctuality you must follow the canonical officers to the letter as to the exercises marked on the card they are not of obligation they may be useful as they are laid down for people who are very young and devoid of all initiative but as i think at least they somewhat hamper others and as a general rule we do not trouble the retreatants here we let solitude act on them it belongs to yourself to discriminate and distinguish the best mode of occupying your time holily therefore i will not impose on you any of the reading laid down on this card and only take leave to get you to say the little office of the blessed virgin have you it here it is said durtal holding out a bound book your volume is charming said father Etienne, as he turned over the pages exquisitely printed in red and black he paused at one of them and read aloud the third lesson of matins is it not fine he cried a sudden joy sprang up in his face his eyes grew bright his hands trembled on the cover yes he said closing it read this office here especially for you know our true patroness the true abbot of the trappists is the blessed virgin after a silence he continued i have fixed a week as the duration of your retreat in the letter i sent to the abbe gevresin but i need not say that if you are not too weary here you can stay as long as it seems good to you i hope to be able to prolong my stay among you but this must depend upon the way in which my body stands the struggle my stomach is somewhat weak and i am not without some fear i shall therefore be much obliged to you if you will let me see the confessor as soon as possible good you shall see him to-morrow i will tell you the time this evening after compline as for the food if you think it insufficient i will see that you have an extra egg but there ceases the discretion i can exercise for the rule is precise no fish no flesh vegetables and i am bound to admit they are not first-rate but you shall judge and indeed as it is just upon supper time i will show you the room where you will dine in company with monsieur bruno and as they descended the staircase the monk went on 
monsieur bruno is a person who has renounced the world and without having taken the vows lives enclosed he is what our rule calls an oblate he is a holy and learned man whom you will certainly like you can talk with him during the meal ah oh, said durtal and before and after i must keep silence yes unless you have anything to ask in which case i shall always be at your service ready to answer you as for that question of silence as for those of the hours of rising and going to bed and the officers the rule allows no modification it must be observed to the letter good said durtal a little taken aback by the decided tone of the father but i saw on my card a note directing me to consult a table of regulations and i have not that table it hangs on the wall of the staircase near your room you can read it when your head is rested to-morrow will you go in he said opening a door in the lower corridor just opposite that of the auditorium durtal bowed to an old gentleman who came to meet him the monk introduced them and vanished the dishes were on the table two poached eggs a bowl of rice another of french beans and a pot of honey monsieur bruno said grace and proceeded to help durtal he gave him an egg this is a poor supper for a parisian he said with a smile oh, as long as there is an egg and wine it is bearable i was afraid i confess that my only drink would be cold water they talked as friends the man was pleasant and distinguished with ascetic features but with a bright smile lighting up a grave face yellow and wrinkled he lent himself with perfect good grace to durtal's inquiries and told him that after a tempestuous life he felt that grace had touched him and he had retired from the world to expiate by years of austerities and silence his own sins and those of others and you have never grown tired of being here never during the five years that i have spent in this cloister time cut up as it is at la trappe seems short you are present at all the exercises of the community yes i only replace manual labour by meditation in my cell my position as ablate however dispenses me if i so wish from getting up at two o'clock to follow the night office but it is a great joy to me to recite the magnificent benedictine psalter before daybreak but you are listening to me and eat nothing let me give you a little more rice no thank you but i will take if you will allow me a spoonful of honey the food is not bad he said but i do not quite understand the same strange and identical taste in all the dishes it smells how shall i express it like burnt fat or suet that is the warm oil with which the vegetables are dressed you will soon grow accustomed to it in a couple of days you will cease to notice it but in what consists precisely the part of an oblate his life is less austere and more contemplative than that of a monk he may travel if he will and though he is not bound by vows he shares in all the spiritual advantages of the order in old times the rule admitted those whom it styled familiars those were oblates who received the tonsure wore a distinct costume and pronounced the three greater vows they led in fact a mitigated life half layman half monk this rule which still exists among the true benedictines has disappeared among the trappists since the year twelve ninety three the date at which it was suppressed by the chapter general at the present time in the cistercian abbeys are only the fathers the lay brothers the oblates when there are any and the peasants employed in field labour the lay brothers i suppose are those whose heads are completely shaven and who are clothed in a brown habit like the monk who opened the door to me yes they do not sing office and have only manual tasks by the way the rule for retreat which i read in my room does not seem clear as far as i recall it it doubles certain offices places matins at four in the afternoon and vespers at two in any case the horary is not the same as that of the trappists how am i to understand and reconcile them you have only to take into consideration the exercises set out on your card father Etienne must i think have said so that mould was only made for people who cannot occupy and guide themselves that explains to you how to prevent them from becoming idle the priest's breviary has been in some degree taken to pieces and their time has been distributed in small slices so that for instance they may be obliged to recite the psalms for matins at hours when there is no psalm dinner was over monsieur bruno said grace and said to durtal you have twenty minutes free from now to compline 
you can make acquaintance with the garden and woods he bowed politely and went out i can smoke a cigarette thought durtal when he was alone he took his hat and left the room night was coming on he passed through the great court skirted a small building surmounted by a long chimney stack discovered by the smell that it was a chocolate factory and entered an avenue of trees the sky was so obscure that he could scarcely see the group of trees he entered and not seeing any one he rolled his cigarettes and smoked them slowly with enjoyment consulting his watch from time to time by his cigar lights he was astonished at the silence of the monastery not a sound however hushed however distant save now and then a gentle rustle of boughs he went to the side whence the noise came and saw a piece of water on which a swan was sailing which came towards him he saw its white plumage oscillate against the darkness which it displaced with a splash when a bell sounded with slow strokes ah said he looking again at his watch that is the hour of compline he went to the chapel which was still empty and he took occasion of the solitude to examine it at his ease it was in the form of a truncated cross a cross without a foot rounded at the summit holding out two square arms with a door at either end the upper part of the cross below a cupola painted blue formed a little circular apse round which was a circle of stalls placed back against the wall in the middle rose a great altar of white marble surmounted by wooden chandeliers flanked on the left and right by candelabra also of wood placed on marble shafts the lower part of the altar was hollow and closed in front by a glass behind which appeared a shrine in gothic style which reflected in its copper gilt mirror the light of the lamps the apse opened into a large porch with three steps in front on the arms of the cross which were prolonged into a kind of vestibule serving at once as nave and side aisles to this stumpy church the hollowed arms at their extremities near the doors held two very small chapels set back in niches painted blue like the cupola containing above two stone altars without ornament two mediocre statues one of st joseph the other of christ lastly a fourth altar dedicated to the virgin was situated in this vestibule opposite the steps leading to the apse opposite therefore to the high altar it was relieved against a window whose lights represented saint bernard in white on one hand and saint benedict in black on the other and it appeared to recede into the church because of the two ranges of seats which stood on the left and right before the two other little chapels leaving only room necessary to pass along the vestibule or to go in a straight line from this altar of the virgin in the apse to the high altar this sanctuary is alarmingly ugly said durtal who had sat down on a bench in front of the statue of saint joseph to judge by the few subjects carved along the walls this edifice dates from the time of louis sixteen an abominable date for a church he was disturbed in these thoughts by the sound of bells and at the same time all the doors were opened one situated in the apse itself on the left of the altar gave passage to about half a score monks wrapped in great white cowls who spread out into the choir and occupied the stalls on either side then by the two doors of the vestibule came a crowd of brown monks who knelt at the benches on the two sides of our lady's altar durtal had some of them near him but they bowed their heads and joined their hands he dared not observe them moreover the vestibule had become almost dark the light was concentrated in the choir where the lamps were kindled he could make out the faces of the white monks in their stalls in the part of the apse he could see and among them he recognized father Etienne on his knees near a short monk but another at the end of the stalls near the porch almost opposite the altar and in full light attracted him he was tall and strong and looked like an arab in his white burnous durtal could only see him in profile and he distinguished a long grey beard a shaven skull surrounded by the monastic crown a high forehead and a nose like an eagle's beak he had a grand appearance with his imperious features and his fine figure as it swayed under the cowl that is probably the abbot of la trappe thought durtal and he felt certain when this monk struck a little bell hidden under the desk before him and directed the office all the monks bowed to the altar the abbot recited the opening prayers then there was a pause and from the other side of the apse which durtal could not see rose the frail voice of an old man a voice which had returned to the clear tones of childhood but was just a little cracked growing higher as it declaimed the antiphon deus in adjutorium meum intende 
and the other side of the choir that on which were father Etienne and the abbot answered scanning the syllables very slowly with voices of bass pitch domine ad adjuvandum me festina and all bowed their heads over the folios placed before them and took up the words gloria patri et filio et spiritui sancto and they lifted their heads while the other part of the fathers pronounced the response sicut erat in principio et cetera the office began it was not chanted but declaimed now rapid and now slow the side of the choir which durtal saw made all the vowels sharp and short letters the other on the contrary altered them all into long letters and seemed to cap all the o's with a circumflex accent it might be said that one side had the pronunciation of the south the other that of the north thus chanted the office became strange and ended by rocking like an incantation and soothing the soul which fell asleep in the rolling of the verses interrupted by the recurrent doxology like a refrain after the last verse of each of the psalms oh, well i cannot understand it thought durtal who had his compline at his fingers ends they are not singing the roman office at all the fact is that one of the psalms was wanting he caught indeed at one moment the hymn of saint ambrose the te lucis ante terminum sung to a simple and rugged tune of the old plain chant and yet the last stanza was not the same but he lost himself afresh and waited for the short lessons and the nunc dimittis which never came yet compline does not vary like vespers he thought i must ask father Etienne the meaning of this to-morrow then his reflections were disturbed by a young white monk who passed him genuflected to the altar and lighted two tapers suddenly all rose and with a great shout the salve regina shook the arches durtal was affected as he listened to this admirable chant which had nothing in common with that which is bellowed at paris in the churches this was at once flexible and ardent sustained by such suppliant adoration that it seemed to concentrate in itself alone the immemorial hope of humanity and its eternal lamentation chanted without accompaniment unsustained by the organ by voices indifferent to themselves and blending in one only masculine and deep it rose with quiet boldness sprang up with irresistible flight towards our lady then made as it were a return upon itself and its confidence was lessened it advanced more tremblingly but so different so humble that it felt itself forgiven and dared then in passionate appeals to demand the undeserved pleasures of heaven it was the absolute triumph of the neumes those repetitions of notes on the same syllable the same word which the church invented to paint the excess of that interior joy or sorrow which words cannot render it was a rush a going forth of the soul escaping in the passionate voices breathed forth by the bodies of the monks as they stood and trembled durtal followed in his prayer book this work with so short a text so long a chant and as he listened to and read it with recollection this magnificent prayer seemed to decompose as a whole and to represent three different states of the soul to exhibit the triple phase of humanity during its youth its maturity and its decline it was in a word an essential summary of prayer for all ages first there was the canticle of exultation the joyous welcome of a being yet little stammering forth respectful caresses petting with gentle words and fondness of a child who seeks to coax his mother this is the salve regina mater misericordia vita dulcedo et spes nostra salve then the soul so candid so simply happy has grown and knowing the wilful failings of thought the repeated loss through sin joins her hands and asks sobbing for help she adores no longer with a smile but with tears it is ad te clamamus exules filii hevai ad te suspiramus gementes et flentes in hac lacrimarum vale at last old age comes the soul lies tormented by the memory of counsels neglected by regret for lost graces and having become weaker and more full of fears is alarmed before her deliverance before the destruction of that prison of the flesh which she feels at hand and then she thinks of the eternal death of those whom the judge condemns on her knees she implores the advocatress of earth the consultrix of heaven it is the eia ergo advocata nostra ilios tuos misericordes oculos ad nos converte et jesum 
benedictum fructum ventris tui nobis post hoc exilium ostende and to that essence of prayer composed by peter of compostella or hermann contract saint bernard in an excess of hyperdulia added the three invocations at the end o clemens o pia o dulcis virgo maria sealing the inimitable prose with a triple seal by those three cries of love which recall the hymn to the affectionate adoration of its beginning this is unprecedented thought durtal as the trappists chanted these sweet and eager appeals the neumes were prolonged on the o's which passed through all the colours of the soul through the whole register of sound and these interjections summed up again in the series of notes which clothed them the inventory of the human soul which now recapitulated the whole body of the hymn and suddenly at the word maria at the glorious cry of that name the chant fell the tapers were extinguished the monks fell on their knees a silence like death came upon the chapel the bells rang slowly and the angelus unfolded under the arches the separated petals of its clear sounds all now prostrate their faces buried in their hands were praying and this lasted long then the sound of the little handbell was heard every one rose genuflected to the altar and in silent file the monks disappeared through the door in the apse ah oh, the true creator of plain music the unknown author who cast into the brain of man the seed of plain chant was the holy ghost said durtal sick and dazzled with tears in his eyes monsieur bruno whom he had not noticed in the chapel came and joined him they crossed the court without speaking and when they had entered the guest-house m bruno lighted two candles gave one to durtal and said gravely i wish you a good night sir durtal went up the staircase behind him they bowed again on the landing and durtal entered his cell the wind blew under the door and the room scarcely lighted by the low flame of the candle seemed to him gloomy the high ceiling vanished in shadow and rained down darkness durtal sat down by his bed discouraged and yet he was thrust forward by one of those impulses it is impossible to translate into words in which it seems that the heart swells almost to bursting and before his inability to get away and fly from self durtal ended by becoming a child again by weeping without definite cause simply from the need of relieving himself by tears he sank down at the prie dieu expecting he knew not what which never came then before the crucifix which stretched its arms above him he began to speak to him and to say to him in low tones father i have driven the swine from my being but they have trampled on me and covered me with mire and the very sty is in ruins have pity on me for i return from a distant land have mercy o lord on the swineherd without a house i have entered into thy house do not send me away be to me a kindly host wash me oh he said suddenly that reminds me that i have not seen father Etienne, who was to tell me the hour at which the confessor would receive me to-morrow he has no doubt forgotten to ask him so much the better at any rate it will put it off for a day my soul is so cramped that i have indeed need of rest he undressed sighing i must be up at half-past three to be in the chapel at four i have no time to lose if i wish to sleep if only i have no neuralgia to-morrow and can wake before dawn end of part two chapter one part two chapter two of en route by jory karl heismans translated by charles keegan paul this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. He passed a most terrible night. It was so special, so dreadful, that he did not remember in the whole of his existence to have endured such anguish, undergone the like fears. It was an uninterrupted succession of sudden wakings and of nightmares. And these nightmares overpassed the limits of abomination that the most dangerous madness dreams. They developed themselves in the realm of lust and they were so special so new to him that when he woke durtal remained trembling almost crying out it was not at all that involuntary and well-known act that vision which ceases just at the moment when the sleeper clasps an amorous form 
it was as and more complete than in nature long and accomplished accompanied by all the preludes all the details all the sensations and the orgasm took place with a singularly painful acuteness an incredible spasm a strange fact which seemed to point at the difference between this state and the unconscious uncleanness of night was beyond certain episodes and caresses which could only follow each other in reality but were united at the same moment in the dream the sensation clear and precise of a being of a fluid form disappearing with the sharp sound of a percussion cap or the crack of a whip close by on waking this being was felt near him so distinctly that the sheet disarranged by the wind of the flight was still in motion and he looked at the empty place in terror ah oh, thought durtal when he had lighted his candle this carries me back to the time when i used to visit madame chantelouve and reminds me of the stories of the succubus he remained sitting up in bed astonished and looked with real uneasiness round the cell steeped in shadow he looked at his watch it was only eleven o'clock at night god he said if the nights are always like this in monasteries he had recourse to bathing with cold water in order to recover himself opened his window to change the air and lay down again thoroughly chilled he hesitated to blow out his candle uneasy at the darkness which seemed to him inhabited full of ambushes and threats he decided at last to extinguish it and repeated the stanza he had already heard sung that evening in chapel procul regedan somnia et noctium phantasmata ostemque nostrum comprime ne poluantur corpora he ended by falling asleep and dreamt again of impurity but he came to himself in time to break the charm experiencing again the impression of a shadow evaporating before he could seize it in the sheets he looked at his watch it was two o'clock if this goes on i shall be broken down to-morrow he thought but he succeeded somehow or other in dozing and waking every ten minutes to wait for three o'clock if i fall asleep again i shall not be able to wake at the moment i wish he thought suppose i get up he sprang out of bed dressed prayed reduced his thoughts to order real excesses would have exhausted him less than these sham freaks but what seemed to him especially odious was the want of satisfaction left by the completed rape of these ghosts compared with their greedy tricks the caresses of a woman only diffused a temperate pleasure and ended in a feeble shock but with this succuba one remained in a fury at having clasped only the void at having been the dupe of a lie the plaything of an appearance of which one could not remember the form or the features it necessarily brought with it the desire of the flesh the wish to clasp a real body and durtal began to think of florence she at least quenched his desires and did not leave him thus panting and feverish in quest of he knew not what in an atmosphere where he was surrounded spied upon by an unknown whom he could not discern by a phantom he could not escape then durtal shook himself and would repulse the assault of these memories at any rate i will go and breathe the fresh air and smoke a cigarette we will see afterwards he descended the staircase whose walls seemed not to keep their place and danced in the light of his candle threaded the corridors blew out his light placed the candlestick near the auditorium and rushed out it was pitch dark at the height of the first story a round window in the wall of the chapel cut a hole through the darkness like a red moon durtal took a few whiffs of a cigarette and then made his way to the chapel he turned the latch of the door gently the vestibule into which he entered was dark but the apse though it was empty was lighted by numerous lamps he made a step crossed himself and fell back for he had stumbled over a body and he looked down at his feet he had come upon a battlefield on the ground human forms were lying in the attitudes of combatants mowed down by grape-shot some flat on their faces others on their knees some leaning their hands on the ground as if stricken from behind others extended with their fingers clenched on their breast others again holding their heads or stretching out their arms and from this group in their agony rose no groan no complaint durtal was stupefied as he looked at this massacre of monks and suddenly stopped with open mouth a shaft of light fell from a lamp which the father sacristan had just placed in the apse and crossing the porch it showed a monk on his knees before the altar dedicated to the virgin he was an old man of more than fourscore years motionless as a statue his eyes fixed leaning forward in such an access of adoration 
that the faces in ecstasy in the early masters seemed compared with his forced and cold yet his features were vulgar his shaven skull without a crown tanned by many suns and rains was brick coloured his eye was dim covered with a film by age his face was wrinkled shrivelled stained like an old log hidden in a thicket of white hair while his somewhat snub nose made the general effect of the face singularly common but there went out not from his eyes nor his mouth but from everywhere and nowhere a kind of angelic look which was diffused over his head and enveloped all his poor body bowed in its heap of rags in this old man the soul did not even give herself the trouble to reform and ennoble his features she contented herself in annihilating them with her rays it was as it were the nimbus of the old saints not now remaining round the head but extending over all the features pale and almost invisible bathing his whole being he saw nothing and heard nothing monks dragged themselves on their knees came to warm themselves and to take shelter near him and he never moved dumb and deaf so rigid that you might have believed him dead had not his lower lip stirred now and then lifting in this movement his long beard the dawn whitened the windows and as the darkness was gradually dissipated the other brethren were visible in turn to durtal all these men wounded by divine love prayed ardently flashed out beyond themselves noiselessly before the altar some were quite young on their knees with their bodies upright others their eyeballs in ecstasy were leaning back and seated on their heels others again were making the way of the cross and were often placed each opposite another face to face and they looked without seeing as with the eyes of the blind and among these lay brethren some fathers buried in their great white cowls lay prostrate and kissed the ground oh to pray pray like these monks cried durtal within himself he felt his unhappy soul grow slack within him in this atmosphere of sanctity he unbent himself and sank down on the pavement humbly asking pardon from christ for having soiled by his presence the purity of this place he prayed long unsealing himself for the first time recognizing his unworthiness and vileness so that he could not imagine how in spite of his mercy the lord could tolerate him in the little circle of his elect he examined himself saw clearly and avowed that he was inferior to the least of these lay brothers who perhaps could not even spell out a book understood that the culture of the mind was naught and the culture of the soul was all and little by little without perceiving it thinking only of stammering forth acts of gratitude he disappeared from the chapel his soul borne up by the souls of others away away from the world far from his charnel house far from his body in this chapel the impulse had come at last the going forth from self till now refused was at last permitted he no longer strove with self as in the time when he escaped with so great difficulty from his prison house as at saint severin or notre dame de victoire then he again realized this chapel where his animal part had alone remained and he looked round him with astonishment the greater part of the brethren had gone one father remained prostrate before our lady's altar he quitted it in his turn and went back to the apse as the other fathers entered it durtal looked at them they were of all sizes and all kinds one fat and bald with a long black beard and spectacles some little fair and puffy men some very old bristling with skin like a wild boar others very young with a vague air of german dreaminess with their eyes under their glasses and almost all except the very young had this feature in common a large belly and cheeks with little red streaks suddenly through the open door in the apse itself appeared the tall monk who had conducted the office the evening before he threw back on his chasuble the woollen hood which covered his head and assisted by two white monks went up to the high altar to say mass and it was not one of those masses served as so many are cooked in paris but a mass slow meditated and profound a mass where the priest takes long to consecrate overwhelmed before the altar and when he elevated the host no little bell tinkled but the bells of the monastery spread abroad their slow peal brief dull strokes almost plaintive while the trappists disappeared crouched on all fours their heads hidden below their desks when the mass ended it was nearly six o'clock durtal took the same way as the evening before passed before the little chocolate factory and saw through the windows the fathers wrapping up the tablets in lead paper 
and in another room a tiny steam engine which a lay brother was directing he reached the walk where he had smoked the cigarettes in the shade so gloomy at night it was now charming with its two rows of aged limes which rustled gently while the wind wafted to him their enervating scent seated on a bench he could see at a glance the whole front of the abbey before it was a long kitchen garden with here and there some rose trees spread over the bluish basins and large balls of cabbages and the old house built in the monumental style of the seventeenth century extended solemn and immense with eighteen windows in a row and a pediment in the span of which was placed a mighty clock it was roofed with slate and surmounted by a ring of small bells and was reached by a flight of several steps it reached a height of at least five stories though it had in reality only a ground and a first floor but to judge by the unexpected height of the windows the rooms had to accommodate their ceilings to the vast altitude of the church on the whole the building was striking and cold more apt since it had been converted into a convent to shelter the disciples of jansen than the sons of saint bernard the weather was warm that morning the sun was filtered through the moving sieve of foliage and the daylight thus screened was changed to rose colour as it touched the white durtal who was about to read his prayer-book saw the pages growing red and by the law of complementary colours all the letters printed in black ink grew green he was amused by these details and with his back to the warmth he brightened up in this aromatic breeze rested in this bath of sunshine from his fatigues of the night when at the end of the walk he saw some of the brothers they walked in silence some carrying under their arms great round loaves others holding milk cans or baskets full of hay and eggs they passed before him and bowed respectfully all had a joyous and serious aspect ah good fellows he thought for they helped me this morning it is to them i owe it that i could keep silence no longer and was able to pray to have at last known the joy of supplication which at paris was only a snare for me to them and above all to our lady de latre who had pity on my poor soul he sprang from his bench in an access of joy went into the lateral walks reached the piece of water he had partially seen the evening before in front of it rose the huge cross he had seen at a distance from the carriage in the wood before he reached la trappe it was placed opposite the monastery itself and turned its back upon the pond it bore an eighteenth-century christ of natural size in white marble the pond also took the form of a cross such as is shown on the greater part of the plans of churches this brown and liquid cross was spotted by duckweed which the swan displaced as he swam he came towards durtal with extended beak expecting no doubt a piece of bread not a sound arose in this deserted spot save the rustle of dry leaves which durtal brushed as he walked the clock struck seven he remembered that breakfast would be ready and he walked quickly to the abbey father etienne was waiting for him shook hands asked if he had slept well then said what would you like i can only offer you milk and honey i will send to-day to the nearest village and try to get you a little cheese but you will have only a poor meal this morning durtal proposed to exchange the milk for wine declaring that he should then do very well and said in any case i should do ill to complain for you are fasting the monk smiled just now he said we are doing penance on account of certain feasts of our order and he explained that he only took food once a day at two o'clock in the afternoon after nones and you have not even wine and eggs to keep up your strength father etienne smiled again one gets accustomed to it he said what is this rule in comparison with that adopted by saint bernard and his companions when they went to till the valley of clairvaux their meal consisted of oak leaves salted cooked in muddy water after a silence the father continued no doubt the trappist rule is hard but it is mild if we carry our thoughts back to the rule of saint pacomius in the east only think whoever wished to join that order had to remain ten days and nights at the door of the convent and had to endure spitting and insults if he still desired to enter he fulfilled a three years novitiate inhabited a hut where he could not stand up nor lie at full length ate only olives and cabbage prayed twelve times in the morning twelve times in the afternoon twelve times in the night the silence was perpetual and his mortifications never ceased to prepare himself for this novitiate and to learn to subdue his appetite 
sent macarius thought of the plan of soaking his bread in a vessel with a very narrow neck and only fed on the crumbs which he could take out with his fingers when he was admitted into the monastery he contented himself with gnawing leaves of raw cabbage on sunday ah, they could stand more than we we alas have no longer souls nor bodies stout enough to bear such fasts but do not let that stop your meal make as good an one as you can ah, by the way said the monk be in the auditorium at ten precisely where the father prior will hear your confession and he left the room if durtal had received a blow on his head with a mallet he could not have been more overwhelmed all the scaffolding of his joys so rapidly run up fell this strange fact had occurred in the impulse of joy he had felt since daybreak he had wholly forgotten that he had to confess he had a moment of aberration but i am forgiven he thought the proof is that state of happiness such as i have never known that truly wonderful expansion of soul which i experienced in the chapel and in the wood the idea that nothing had begun that all was still to do terrified him he had not the courage to swallow his bread he drank a little wine and rushed out of doors in a wind of panic he went wildly with great strides confession the prior who was the prior he sought in vain among the fathers whose faces he remembered the one who would hear him my god he said all at once but i do not even know how a confession is made he sought a deserted corner where he could recollect himself a little he was striding along without even knowing how he came there along a walnut tree walk with a wall on one side there were some enormous trees he hid himself behind the trunk of one of them and sitting on the moss turned over the leaves of his prayer book and read on arriving at the confessional place yourself on your knees making the sign of the cross and ask the priest for his blessing saying bless me father for i have sinned then recite the confiteor as far as mea culpa and he stopped and without any need of probing it his life sprang out in jets of filth he shrank from it there was so much of every kind that he was overwhelmed with despair then by an effort of his will he pulled himself together endeavoured to control and bank up these torrents to separate them so as to understand them but one affluent rolled back all the others ended by overwhelming them and became the river itself and this sin appeared at first ape-like and sly at school where every one tempted and corrupted others then there was all his greedy youth dragged through tap-rooms rolled in swine troughs wallowing in the sinks of prostitution and then an ignoble manhood to his regular tasks had succeeded toll paid to his senses and shameful memories assailed him in a crowd he recalled to mind how he had sought after monstrous iniquities his pursuit of artifices aggravating the malice of the act and the accomplices and agents of his sins passed in file before him among all at one time there was a certain madame chantelouve a demoniacal adulteress who had drawn him headlong into frightful excesses who had linked him to nameless crimes sins against holy things to sacrileges how can i tell all this to the monk thought durtal terrified by the remembrance how can i even express myself so as to make him understand without defilement tears rushed from his eyes my god my god he sighed this is indeed too much and in her turn florence appeared with her little street arab smile and her childish haunches i can never tell the confessor all that was brewed in the perfumed shade of her vices cried durtal i can by no means make him face these torrents of pus yet they say this has to be done and he bowed under the weight of the foulness of this girl how shameful to have been riveted to her how disgusting to have satisfied the abominable demands of her desires behind this sewer extended others he had traversed all the districts of sin which the prayer book patiently enumerated he had never confessed since his first communion and with the piling up of years had come successive deposits of sins he grew pale at the thought that he was about to detail to another man all his dirt to acknowledge his most secret thoughts to say to him what one dares not repeat to one's own self lest one should despise oneself too much he sweated with anguish then nausea at his being remorse for his life solaced him and he gave himself up regret for having lived so long in this cesspool was a very crucifixion to him he wept long doubting pardon not even daring to ask it 
so vile did he feel himself at last he sprang up the hour of expiation must be at hand in fact his watch pointed to a quarter to ten his agony as he thus wrought with himself had lasted more than two hours he hurriedly reached the main path which led to the monastery he walked with his head down forcing back his tears he slackened his pace somewhat as he drew near the little pond he lifted his eyes in supplication to the cross and as he lowered them he met a look so moved so compassionate so gentle that he stopped and the look disappeared with the bow of a lay brother who passed on his way he read my thoughts said durtal to himself oh this charitable monk has good reason to pity me for indeed i suffer ah lord that i might be like that humble brother he cried remembering that he had seen that very morning the young tall lad praying in the chapel with such fervour that he seemed to rise from the ground before our lady he arrived at the auditorium in a frightful state and sank on a chair then like a hunted animal that thinks itself discovered he sprang up and disturbed by his fears moved by a wind of disorder he thought of flight that he would pack his bag and make for the train he mastered himself undecided and trembling his ear on the watch his heart beating with great strokes and he heard the sound of distant steps my god he said waiting for the steps that drew near what manner of monk is coming the steps were silent and the door opened durtal in his alarm dared not look at the confessor in whom he recognized the tall trappist with the imperious profile whom he believed to be the abbot of the monastery his breath was taken away and he drew back without saying a word surprised at this silence the prior said you have asked to make your confession sir and at a sign from durtal he pointed out the prie dieu placed against the wall and himself knelt down turning his back durtal braced himself fell down at the prie dieu and then completely lost his head he had vaguely prepared how to enter on the matter noted the points of his statement classified his sins in some degree and now remembered nothing the monk rose sat down on a straw chair leant towards the penitent his hand behind his ear to hear the better he waited durtal wished rather to die than speak he succeeded however in mastering himself and bridling his shame he opened his lips but no word came he remained overwhelmed his head in his hands repressing the tears he felt ready to fall the monk did not move at last he made a desperate effort stammered the beginning of the confiteor and said i have not confessed since my childhood since then i have led a shameful life i have the words would not come the trappist remained silent and did not assist him at all i have committed every kind of debauch i have done everything everything he choked and the tears he had repressed flowed he wept his body was shaken his face hidden in his hands and as the prior still bending over him did not move but i cannot he cried i cannot all that life he could not bring out stifled him he sobbed in despair at the view of his sins and crushed also at finding himself thus abandoned without a word of kindness without help it seemed to him that all was giving way that he was lost repulsed even by him who yet had directed him to this abbey then a hand was laid on his shoulder while a gentle low voice said your soul is too tired for me to fatigue you with questions come back at nine o'clock tomorrow we shall have time before us we shall not then be hurried by any office from now till then think of the story of calvary the cross which was made for the sins of the whole world lay so heavily on the shoulders of the saviour that his knees bent and he fell a man of cyrene passed by who helped the lord to bear it you in detesting in weeping for your sins have alleviated and rendered lighter if one may say so the cross of the burthen of your sins and having made it less heavy have thus allowed our lord to lift it he has recompensed you by the most astonishing of miracles the miracle of having brought you here from so far off thank him then with all your heart and be not discomforted you will say to-day for your penance the penitential psalms and the litany of the saints i will give you my blessing and the prior blessed him and went out durtal raised himself up after his tears 
what he feared so much had happened the monk who would take him in hand was impassive almost dumb alas he thought my abscesses are ripe but it needs the cut of a lancet to open them after all he went on as he went upstairs to bathe his eyes in his cell this trappist was compassionate at last not so much in what he said as the tone in which he said it then to be just he was perhaps confused by my tears the abbe gevresin certainly did not tell father Essien that i was taking refuge in la trappe in order to be converted let us put ourselves in the place of a man living in god far from the world over whose head a shower bath is suddenly discharged well we shall see to-morrow and durtal made haste to sponge his face for it was nearly eleven o'clock and the office of sext was about to begin he went to the chapel which was almost empty for the brothers were working at that time in the chocolate factory and in the fields the fathers were in their places in the apse the prior struck his bell all signed themselves with a large cross and on the left where he could not see for durtal had taken the same place as in the morning near st joseph's altar a voice arose ave maria gratia plena dominus tecum and the other part of the choir answered et benedictus fructus ventris tui jesus there was a moment's pause and the pure thin voice of the old trappist sang as before the office of compline the evening before deus in adjutorum meum intende and the liturgy continued its course with its gloria patri etc during which the monks bowed their foreheads on their books and with its series of psalms accented in short tones on the one side and long on the other durtal as he knelt allowed himself to be rocked by the psalmody too tired to be able to pray himself then when sext was ended all the fathers meditated and durtal caught a look of pity from the prior who turned a little towards his bench he understood that the monk implored the saviour for him and perhaps asked god to show him the way in which he might conduct himself on the morrow durtal rejoined m bruneau in the court they shook hands and the oblate announced the presence of a new guest a retreatant no a curate from the neighbourhood of lyon he has come to see the abbot who is ill but i thought the abbot of notre dame de latre was the tall monk who led the office oh no that was the prior father maximin you have not seen the abbot and i doubt if you will see him for i do not think he will leave his bed before you go they reached the guest-house and found father etienne making excuses to a short fat priest for the poor fare he could offer he was a jovial priest with strong features moulded in yellow fat he joked m bruneau whom he seemed to have known some time on the sin of gluttony which must so often be committed at la trappe then tasted pretending a chuckle of delight the scentless bouquet of the poor wine he poured out and lastly when he divided with a spoon the omelette which was the main dish of their dinner he pretended to cut up a fowl and to be delighted with the fine appearance of the flesh saying to durtal this is a barley fed fowl may i offer you a wing this kind of pleasantry exasperated durtal who had no wish to laugh that day he therefore was satisfied to make a vague bow wishing to himself that the end of dinner was at hand the conversation continued between the priest and m bruneau after it had spread over various commonplaces it took a more definite form in regard to an invisible otter which plundered the abbey ponds but no doubt said the curate you have found its lair never it is easy to see in the lane grass the paths it traverses to get to the water but we always lose its traces at the same spot we have watched for days with father etienne but it has never shown itself the abbe explained various traps which might be set with advantage durtal thought of the otter hunt which balzac tells so pleasantly at the beginning of his paysan when the dinner came to an end the curate said grace and said to m bruneau suppose we take a turn the fresh air will do instead of the coffee which they forget to give us durtal returned to his cell he felt himself emptied injured cheated reduced to a state of fibre a state of pulp his body crushed by the nightmares of the night enervated by the scene of the morning needed entire rest and if his soul had not still that infatuation which had broken it in tears at the monk's feet it was sad and restless and it also asked for silence repose and sleep let us see said durtal i must not give way let me bestir myself he read the penitential psalms and the litanies of the saints 
then he hesitated between two volumes of saint bonaventure and saint angela he decided on the blessed angela she had sinned and had been converted and she seemed less far from him more intelligible more helpful than the seraphic doctor than a saint who had always remained pure sheltered from falls for she too had been a carnal sinner she too had reached the saviour from afar a married woman she lived in adultery and shame lovers succeeded one another and when she had exhausted them she threw them aside like husks suddenly grace rose in her and made her soul break forth she went to confession not daring to avow the more awful of her sins and she communicated thus grafting sacrilege upon her other faults she lived day and night tortured by remorse and finally prayed to st francis of assisi to help her and the next night the saint appeared to her my sister he said if you had called on me sooner i should have granted your prayer before this the next day she went to church heard a priest preaching understood she must address herself to him and laid all before him in a full confession then began the trials of an appalling life of purification in blow after blow she lost her mother her husband her children she went through such violent temptations to impurity that she was obliged to seize on lighted coals and cauterize the plague of her senses with fire during two years the demon sifted her she parted her goods among the poor assumed the habit of the third order of st francis gathered in the sick and infirm and begged for them in the streets one day a feeling of sickness came over her before a leper whose sores were stinking to punish herself she drank the water in which she had washed the sores she was overcome with nausea and punished herself yet more by forcing herself to swallow a scab which had not gone down with the water and remained dry in her throat for years she dressed ulcers and meditated on the passion of christ then her novitiate of sorrows drew to a close and a radiant day of visions dawned on her jesus treated her as a spoiled child called her my sweetest my well-beloved daughter he dispensed her from the necessity of eating and nourished her only with the sacred species he called her drew her absorbed her in uncreated light and by anticipating her inheritance enabled her to understand in life the joys of heaven and she was so simple and timid that she feared in spite of all for the memory of her sins alarmed her she could not believe herself forgiven and said to christ ah if i could but put myself in an iron collar and drag myself to the market-place to proclaim my shame and he consoled her be easy my daughter my sufferings have atoned for your sins and as she reproached herself for having lived in opulence and having delighted in clothes and jewels he addressed her smiling to buy you riches i have wanted for everything you required a great number of clothes and i had but one garment of which the soldiers stripped me which they drew lots my nakedness was the expiation of your vanity in ornaments and all her conversations with christ were in this tone he passed his time in comforting this humble creature whom his benefits overwhelmed and this has made her the most loving of the saints her work is a succession of spiritual outpourings and caresses her book is such a living hearth that beside it the volumes of other mystics seem but dull coal ah said durtal to himself in turning over these pages it was indeed the christ of st francis the god of mercy who spoke to this franciscan and he went on that ought to give me courage for angela of foligno was as great a sinner as i am but all her sins were remitted yes but then what a soul she had while mine is good for nothing instead of loving i reason nevertheless it is right to remember that the conditions of the blessed angela were more favourable than mine living in the thirteenth century she had a shorter journey to make to approach god for since the middle ages each century takes us further from him she lived in a time full of miracles which overflowed with saints for me i live in paris in an age when miracles are rare and saints scarcely abound and once away from here what a vista is before me of falling away of soaking myself in a stew of infamy in a bath of the sins of great cities by the way he looked at his watch and started it was two o'clock i have missed the office of nones he said i must simplify my complicated horary or i shall never know where i am and at once he traced in a few lines morning rise at three o'clock or rather at three thirty breakfast at seven sext at eleven dinner at eleven thirty nones at one thirty vespers at five fifteen 
supper at six and compline at seven twenty five there at least that is clear and easy to remember if only father Etienne have not noticed my absence from chapel he left his room ah here is the famous rule he said to himself on seeing a framed table hung on the landing he approached and read rule for visitors it was composed of numerous paragraphs and opened as follows those whom divine providence has guided to this monastery are requested to note the following they will at all times avoid meeting the religious and lay brothers and will not go near their places of work they are forbidden to leave the cloister for the farm or the neighbourhood of the monastery then came a series of instructions which he had already seen on the printed horary durtal skipped several paragraphs and read again visitors are requested not to write anything on the doors not to strike matches on the wall and not to spill water on the floor they are not allowed to visit each other's rooms or to speak to one another smoking is not allowed in the house nor indeed outside thought durtal but i want a cigarette badly and he went down in the corridor he ran against father Etienne, who immediately observed that he had not seen him in his place during the office durtal excused himself as well as he could the monk said no more but durtal understood that he was observed and that under his childlike aspect the guest master would where discipline was concerned hold him in an iron grip he was confirmed in this impression when at vespers he noticed that the monk's first glance on entering the chapel was at him but that day he felt so sore and broken that he cared but little this sudden change of existence and of the manner in which he had been accustomed to spend his time astounded him and since the crisis of the morning he had been in a kind of torpor which took from him all power of recovery he drifted to the end of the day no longer thinking of anything sleeping as he stood and when the evening came he fell on his bed a mere inert mass end of part two chapter two